So, good morning, everybody. Welcome to another Garner Smarter. Um, this is a partnership between the Calvert Library and the Master Gardeners. Um, I will be managing all your questions and I will wait to um, ask Cheryl at the end of his presentation. Um, today we will be talking about container gardens. Um, before he begins, I do want to remind you that we'll have another Garner Smarter um, next Saturday starting a garden from scratch and it's a conversational Garden Smarter. So we really would like everybody to participate during that one and that one is at 10 a.m. So whenever you're ready, show you can go ahead and begin. Okay, well, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to our Garden Smarter program. Uh, and uh, of course, as was said, this is brought to you by Master Gardeners, and we are part of the, uh, and we have a technical issue here, is just a second. Why is it not going? <laughs> we are not able to forward our slides for some reason, so give us just a minute here. There we go. For some reason, we had a Okay. A little glitch, but we're on our way now. And uh, the Master Gardeners are part of the College of Agriculture and Natural Resources uh, through the Extension Services in the counties for the University of Maryland. And uh, as was said, my uh, presentation is on bags, barrels, and old boots or container gardening. And uh, we're gonna move pretty quickly because there's a lot of information here. So please on your chat, if you would write down your questions and uh, we can, we're gonna try to save some time at the end to discuss those. Uh, but at any rate, let me make a disclaimer here. Uh, I'm gonna talk primarily about vegetables, herbs, and to some extent flowers. Uh, there's a lot of other topics related to container gardening, but uh, uh, we have to, uh, we're focusing on these, on those things. So, uh, one of the things we're going to do, it's a little different this year, is uh, we're going to illustrate putting together a container garden uh, through uh, pictures and so forth from the Spudnik Container Gardening, which is a Master Gardener project at uh, All Saints Episcopal Church, where Routes 2 and 4 come together. Uh, and just as, let me just say a few things about that uh, real briefly. Uh, this started back in 2016 and we were interested, the, the youth groups, joint youth groups of Broadway Baptist Church and All Saints Episcopal Church wanted to uh, try to interest youth in, uh, in gardening and particularly uh, gardening that uh, was environmentally sound uh, and uh, you know, would help them to get out and, and, and really do something worthwhile and, and also to teach them uh, the responsibility of, of producing a garden, but also donating its produce to those in need, which is what we do. Uh, the way this got started, and the reason you have it, the name of it is because uh, in 2016, we started just planting potatoes and beans and the pole beans. And the reason is those are compa good companion plants. But in order to try to interest the kids, we had them watch the movie, The Martian. And in that, if you remember, Matt Damon is an astronaut to get stranded on Mars and he has to survive for two years. Uh, and they built this big biosphere so that uh, astronauts could come back until a rescue uh, could be mounted to, to rescue him. Well, he had some potatoes up there that uh, they had taken up because they were gonna be there over Thanksgiving and there were some potatoes left. And he had to figure out uh, how to, uh, from the sterile Martian soil, how to make a viable soil where he could plant potatoes to help him survive up there, which he did. So we had uh, all the kids in a container and each of them had their own container, plant potatoes that first year. And if, and they were responsible for it and taking care of it and so forth. If they raised potatoes, uh, then they survived on Mars. If they failed to, then they per perished on Mars. And that's how we got started on that. And by the way, it's not, it's, it's open to any, any youth and even uh, adult volunteers that want to be part of it. Don't have to be members of those two churches. So anyway, uh, let's, uh, with that, we'll jump in here and uh, get moving. Well, why grow plants in containers? Well, there's any number of reasons. I'm not gonna, and I'm not gonna address everything on all these slides. Some of it is, uh, is are pretty obvious, but just, uh, just a few things here. Uh, 
you know, by the way, the, when we talk about mobility there, if you look to the, uh, the picture in there, I'm not going to talk much about uh, flower design at all, uh, but uh, just to let you know, this is a, uh, a, a rather classic type of flower design called uh, thriller spillers and, and uh, or excuse me, thriller fillers and spillers. And the thriller tends to be a taller plant or a plant in the back that's taller that is rather striking. And then you fill in around it with the, the fillers, as you see here. And then the spillers, uh, you know, go down over the sides and kind of soften the container and so forth. But given this container is a wheelbarrow, it, uh, it's, it's very mobile to put around. Uh, but uh, mobility is important because... Uh, you can move containers to places that uh, in your microclimate uh, is, is the best for them. Uh, you, gardening for convenience, for instance, our herb garden here at the, the house is uh, close to uh, the, the back door where the kitchen is, so you can, you can certainly do that. Uh, taking advantage of space. You, with containers, you can uh, plant on areas that you normally wouldn't, like on hardscapes, such as uh, driveways or decks or patios, uh, whatever it might be. And uh, you can sort of make gardening easier in that it's, and we'll talk more about this later, uh, there, it, it's really easier to maintain uh, in the uh, containers because each one of them is a little micro garden of its own. One of the most important things is to take advantage of your microclimate, and we're going to talk more about that. Uh, so with that, there's five essentials to, uh, to container gardening, one uh, in any kind of gardening, really, but, but particularly container garden. You want to make a plan. Uh, by the way, you can see from the pictures that there's all kinds of different sorts of containers that can be used. But you do want to consider your region and your microclimate. And again, we're going to spend some time on that because that is very important. Uh, equipment, you need the, the right equipment uh, and you need the, the, the right containers for your purpose. And we'll talk uh, about that as well. And uh, something that's really critical is using the proper container mix. All right, make a plan. First of all, determine what your purpose is. And then, and then, as we'll see, you'll need to determine the impact of your microclimate because your microclimate is going to answer, help you answer those next few questions. And that is, what are you going to plant? You know, um, where are you going to plant? How much are you going to plant? When are you going to plant? Those sorts of things. And then plan what equipment you need and certainly what containers you'll need. Uh, and I encourage you to make a drawing of your plans of your garden. This doesn't have to be something that's an engineered drawing. It can be a rough sketch, but uh, it really helps you if you draw where your house is, where your hardscapes are, where your lawns and gardens are, where you plan to have the, the gardens. It, uh, it really helps you and it keeps you from at the end having something that just looks haphazard. Uh, but really uh, helps you to have the kind of gardens that you want to have. And we did that with Spudnik. Uh, this is, was our, up in the top right is our basic uh, garden. That was the vegetable garden. And uh, it's, uh, it's a 30 by 30 square. Since it was on church property, we put a Kelty cross in it for the walkways. Uh, and then uh, down in the, uh, the uh, left corner, we inherited this and, and this brickwork here and, and made it into a raised bed for herbs. Actually, that was an old well site on the church. The church had to drill a new well and they were going to tear that out, but we asked them if we could just, we could have it and convert it into a garden, which we did. And then down on the, uh, uh, in the right bottom, we have the kids, some of our volunteers, they're putting together our uh, uh, pollinator garden. And we had them plan that. Uh, and we talked about uh, things like the, uh, that straight lines, you know, like squares and rectangles and so forth had a more formal look, whereas uh, curved lines had a softer look and uh, less formal. And uh, other than just giving, talking to them about that and giving them the approximate dimensions, then they planned that themselves and laid it out and they went with the curved lines and everything to kind of soften the formality of, of the main garden. 
uh, our plans uh, extended. I mean, it kept going. You know, plans are, are not necessarily fixed. They, they continue to develop. And uh, first, I'll take you down to the left uh, corner. The first thing we added is on the top of the garden there, uh, we added a uh, blueberry patch. And unlike the container garden in the main garden, those are actually in the ground. And, uh, but then also uh, in 2019, we put in a automatic water system and up in the right corner, you see them lay in the line for that. Before that, we were watering by hand, which uh, was, uh, took a lot of time and effort. Uh, and then uh, this last year, we put in a children's garden so you, that you see, and we planned that, uh, that's up in the right corner, or left corner, excuse me. And we planned that to be in the shape of a fish uh, because we thought the kids would enjoy that and also because it's an ancient Christian symbol. But actually, as I look at it, it, it look, could be also a rocket ship or if you look at it from the other end, it, it could be an urn or something. But we thought the kids would have fun with it anyway. So anyway, all that's part of planning for your purposes. All right, regional and microclimates. This is a very, uh, this is very important uh, it, uh, part of... Uh, of this presentation. Uh, and it's important that we're aware of these. Uh, first and last frost dates. Now, what are those? Uh, well, first frost date is in the fall. Uh, and what that is, is uh, on what day is there a 10% chance of a frost? And that is statistically based looking back over decades. And on what date uh, is there does it average one out of every 10 years there's a frost? And for Calvert County, that has been traditionally October the 5th. Now, if you look forward to uh, October 21st, the chance of a frost goes up to 50%. Uh, and uh, why is that important? It's important because uh, that's when you wanna start breaking down your garden and that's when you wanna start protecting plants like perennials or whatever that may be uh, that may be sensitive to cold weather or freezing. Uh, the last frost date is in the spring and that has typically been May 10th. And, and that's uh, again, that 10% rule. And it's statistically based over uh, previous decades uh, at uh, on what date uh, has one out of 10, out of one out of 10 years, there been a, a frost even that late in the spring. And that's, uh, May 10th. If you look, if you back it up to April 24th, again, you hit that 50% mark. Uh, so again, that's why is that important? Because that can tell you about the date when you want to start planting your warm weather plants that would be subject to damage or death if they got a frost. Uh, the other thing too is hardiness zones. Hardiness zones have to do with what is the lowest, average lowest temperatures in any region. And Calvert County is in zone seven. Uh, and they, and uh, when they talk about average low temperatures, they talk about a, uh, a range of temperatures. And, uh, and in our case, this is uh, from uh, zero to uh, 10 degrees. So the average low temperatures for Calvert County range in, the, in that, that range and, uh, and that designates it as hardiness zone seven. Now, why is that important? That's important to know because there's some plants here that there's some plants that aren't gonna survive the winter well. You know, you're talking here about perennials and so forth. Uh, and there are some plants that will do quite well in that area. So uh, it, it helps you decide what plants uh, will do well in this particular zone. Uh, average rainfall and snowfall, Calvert County has 45 inches on average of rainfall, which uh, is a little above the national average and about 15 inches of snow per year, which is slightly below the national average. And so those are regional things that are, that are good to know. Now, when we get to microclimate, we're talking about the, the climate around your house, around your property, where you're gonna plant your garden. And, and this is, uh, uh, it is important. And one of the things you need to know about is uh, the, the sunny areas, the partially sunny areas and the shaded areas of your property. Now, when we talk about full sun, we're usually, talk, well, not usually, what we're talking about 
uh, is uh, uh, over six hours of sun. Uh, if we're talking about shade, you're talking about zero to uh, three hours of, of, uh, of sun. And if you're talking about partial sun, partial shade, those are synonyms. Then you're talking about more than three hours up to six hours of sun or shade. Now that's really important because there's certain plants that do well in those various uh, areas. You have some that do well in shade, some that will not grow in shade. You have some that like the, the bright sun for long periods of time and others that uh, will, don't uh, or won't do well or won't grow in that area. And the same thing, you have plants that do well in partial shade, partial sun and, and others that don't do so well. So that helps you to understand what plants you can play you can plant where in and around your property. <clears throat> Wind is another microclimate situation. If you have open areas where you're going to plant things or on a, uh, you know, on a hilltop area or something like that, where strong winds may, uh, may hit the containers, then you have to, you have to do something to protect them and you can, you can weight the containers. And one of the way to do that is add more sand to your container mix. And we'll talk about that. Also, you may have to stake them. Uh, and uh, we have, we have had to do that in, in the Spudnik garden. And we'll talk about that. Exposure, we're talking about the points of the compass. Uh, and that's important because uh, in the, in southern exposure, the, the southeast to the southwest, you're going to have a lot of sun. Uh, unless it's like at our house where you have a bunch of trees back there that, <laughs> that shade on the south side. So we don't have quite as much sun as you would normally have. Uh, to the north, it's going to be shadier. You have, you're going to have some sun that gets there maybe in the early morning and the late afternoon, but for the most part, it's going to be a lot shadier and cooler. Uh, on the east side, you're going to have early morning sun. Uh, and on the west side, you're going to have the afternoon sun that's going to be, and in the summer, that's the real hot sun. Uh, and that's important to know because there's some plants that are heat tolerant, some that are not so heat tolerant. And so all of that can help you to, to understand what kind of plants are going to work on different, different uh, sides of your house. Uh, slope is important. Slope, uh, if you have a, a slope that's, uh, first of all, all slopes are going to be a little bit drier because water runs off of them faster. The other thing too is if you have a slope that's sloping southward, it's going to be a lot warmer with a lot more sun exposure than a slope that's sloping northward, uh, which, which is going to have more shade and, and be cooler. Uh, and so and also slopes are going to have, like I said, have water runoff. And sometimes you have to be cognizant of that and figure out how you're going to control that water runoff. And one of the ways to do it is uh, to use plants. Uh, but uh, reflective heat's another thing that's important in your microclimate. And I mean that is heat that's absorbed by structures like your house or your sheds or your deck and so forth. And also, like your driveway walks and that sort of thing. Like if you have an asphalt drive like we do, that soaks up a lot of heat because it's black. And then when we call it reflective heat because it soaks it up during the day and then reflects it back at night. Um, and that has a bearing because there's uh, some plants again that can handle the heat and some that can't. And so that, that can help determine where you might plant these things. Also, you can use that to extend growing seasons. For instance, uh, you can move plants that might otherwise uh, be, be hurt by cooler weather to areas where uh, they get more of that reflective heat and, uh, and that will help them to produce for a longer period of time. Uh, and, and here I want to say with uh, Spudnik, just to give you some examples, if you uh, look down at the uh, bottom left, you can see where we put it as, as a flat and open area, uh, which, you know, for a vegetable garden uh, and, and even a uh, flower garden with some flowers, that would make sense. Uh, there's not a lot of flat land on, uh, on all states properties, so that was one of the one of the few sites that we could use that the church would allow us to use. And, uh, but also it's full sun. I mean, it gets 
a lot of sun uh, during the day. It gets well over eight hours. Uh, and, uh, and that's good for the, what we're growing down there in terms of both the flowers and the vegetables. It has an east-west orientation. The bottom of the cross pointing towards us there is to the east, the top towards the west. But because it's open like that, uh, we get a lot of uh, west and northwest winds at times with storms that can be quite strong and they can damage uh, particularly those containers where we have taller plants like our indeterminate tomatoes or our pole beans and that sort of thing. So we have to make sure that those uh, uh, containers are weighted and are staked so that they don't blow over and the plants get uh, damaged. So we have to consider that. Uh, it's open area, totally open, so there's no protection there. There's very little reflective heat. What little there might be there would come off of the ground covers and the mulch. Uh, so we have to be cognizant that uh, there may be threats of frost in the spring and fall and be prepared to cover them and watch the weather and so forth. So all of that is microclimate considerations. Also, if you look at the one on the upper right, you can see the slope coming down from the church. That's two, and you're looking over our pollinator garden there. And what happened was, is we found out when we planted the main garden that uh, when it rained, a heavy rain, there'd be a lot of, a lot of runoff down there, more than we expected. We thought it was fl the, the flatness would help, but there's enough of a slope and it would wash our mulch away uh, that's in the garden. We'd have to replace all that. And so we put in that pollinator garden for two reasons. One is to attract pollinators and to provide you know, the nectar and so forth that the pollinators needed, but also to become a buffer to prevent that runoff or slow it down. And that worked very well. And that's uh, another consideration for microclimate. Um, and we went the wrong way there. Let's go the other way. Equipment, I'm not gonna spend much time on this at all, you, but it is important that you have the right equipment when you do your plans. I would say glo uh, gloves and dust mask, particularly, dust, well, when you're dealing with uh, uh, any kind of fungicides, insecticides, even those for organic garden, or when you're dealing with dry fertilizers and you may get dust and stuff, you really don't want to breathe that stuff in. There's compounds and so forth in there that can at the very least irritate your bronchial areas. Uh, you want to water underneath the, the leaves. And so, you know, a watering can or a bubbler or something where you can get underneath the leaves. You don't want to keep watering overhead over and over and the, wet, and the leaves stay relatively wet because that invites disease. Or you can put in what we've done, and we'll talk about this too, and that's a automatic watering system uh, that has uh, the, the spray ends uh, on each of the containers that waters underneath the, the, uh, the leaves. Um, that window screen material, that's interesting. Let me just say a few words about that. The, uh, a lot of people think that in a container they need to put rocks or uh, heaven forbid the, the uh, styrofoam peanuts down in the bottom to help drainage. You don't want to do that. And the reason is because that causes the water to drain too quickly. And you don't want it to do that because then, you, then you, it'll dry out quicker and you have to water more. Uh, and, actually, and the other thing is the roots need that soil going all the way to the bottom. Uh, that's better for the plants. There's more nutrients, there's more moisture held. And so you don't want to do that. But at the same time, you don't want the holes in the bottom of your containers to get plugged. And so they, it drains too slowly. One of the ways you can do that and is a very easy way. And that is just cut some window screen material the size of the bottom of your pot, drop it in there and then put your soil on it. And then it'll, it'll drain it'll drain very well and it'll, it'll drain at a rate that you really want it to. Uh, I'd also mention hand trucks, carts, wheelbarrows. Uh, if you're moving heavy stuff, don't do something where you might hurt yourself. And these guys have the right tool for the right job, as you can see, and that's important. Uh, it's very frustrating for you to get a job going and you don't have the right tools, but these guys know what that is. Okay, so now we get to something that is very fundamentally important, and that is uh, a, a good uh, a container mix. 
you know, this really is the foundation of all, just like a, the foundation of the house has to be strong for you to have a good house. Uh, the soil that you put into your containers is that foundation. Now, what's in a name? What I mean by that is when you go into a garden center, if you're gonna buy the soil commercially, uh, you go into a garden center and you see bags that some of them will say container mix, some of them say container soil, may say seed starter mix, may say garden soil, top soil, <clears throat> and so on and so forth. Well, uh, container mix and container soil are really synonyms and they pretty much mean the same thing. But what you're looking for is in a, in a container soil is something like a, a crumbled up chocolate cake crumbled up in small crumbs and I say chocolate because you want that organic material in there that you'll see with a dark color but you also want uh, some small pores and stuff in the soil that will capture uh, the, the water and the nutrients and hold that and uh, hold enough of it in the soil. When I talk about sweet and sour I'm talking about pH in the soil and uh, and if you don't know what that is that's a scale that measures acidity or alkalinity in the soil. Uh, and it runs from zero to 14 with seven being in the middle, which is neutral. So anything above seven is alkaline. Anything below seven is, uh, is acidic. Most plants like soil slightly acidic to neutral, which is in the six to seven range on the pH scale. There are other plants, and these include things like potatoes or blueberries or azaleas that uh, like, uh, acidic soil and they want those to be definitely below six and some of them even further below than that. Potatoes probably the best is around five to five and a half. Uh, and so you know that uh, and that may you may have to do some amendments to make sure that you have the right pH for what you're planting. Uh, to be young again, well this uh, some of the one of the questions I get over and over is uh, can you reuse the soil? And the answer is yes. And I do, but you have to, but it's best to rejuvenate it. And the reason is, is because uh, the container time will compost itself and it will get denser and lose a lot of that nice light chocolate cake crumb. And uh, the way I handle that, if I'm going to uh, reuse the soil is I'll take about a third of the old soil out. In fact, I'll dump the bag of soil into a, uh, a wheelbarrow or something like that. Take about a, a third of the old soil out, put it somewhere in the yard, and then mix in new components or new soil in that to rejuvenate it. Uh, you will also have to refertilize it and so forth. And that helps to extend the life of the soil and cut down on costs a little bit. Uh, the when I say for Pete's sake, the church choir, what I'm meaning there is the base of most all container mixes uh, are either peat moss or perhaps choir, which comes from the hull of coconuts. And, um, and then to that, the right stuff, and that will be like compost for organic uh, materials, and it may be like vermiculite or perlite to keep it light and fluffy, and we'll talk about that. But once you get all that together, I mean, you mix it up very thoroughly, uh, and and uh, and and you wind up getting the the dirt mix that you want, the container mix that you want by mixing it thoroughly. And what you really want to hit is a light and fluffy mix that drains well, but still holds uh, uh, water and nutrients that's that's needed. And here is uh, our, uh, our container mix, our recipe that we use in the garden. And, and beside that, I have uh, uh, the components that will be in a typical commercial recipe. But uh, we use either peat moss or choir or a combination of both, mostly peat moss, and in one part of that to one part of uh, compost. Now, we use leaf compost. You can, if you have your own compost, you can use that as well. Uh, but uh, this is uh, this recipe is based on uh, four cubic feet. So, and then one part of the vermiculite or perlite or a mix of two or, or rice hulls they're starting to use as well. Now, vermiculite, perlite, rice hulls, 
uh, they help to keep the the mixture light and fluffy that you want it want it to be and um, and so um, the vermiculite and the perlite are natural. They come from volcanic sources. Uh, the vermiculite, however, not only helps to loosen the soil, but it also retains water where perlite does not, but it does help to loosen the soil. And recently rice hulls have been used for that and they do, and, and they do quite well. And we experimented with that last year and they work quite well and they do both like vermiculite. So, and they're definitely a renewable source. Uh, we also add a, a half a cubic uh, foot bag of, of sand, and that's also to keep the soil loose, but also to give it some weight to, you know, help against the winds. And if, you're, if we're going to have uh, things like pole beans or the larger um, uh, indeterminate tomatoes and that sort of thing that could be subject to damage by winds or, or, or knocking over the bags, we may even add another bag more uh, sand to those. Uh, we, use, we put in a 12 pound bag of worm castings, a lot of really good uh, nutrients and micronutrients that's added to the soil by doing that. If we're going to uh, amend it so that it's uh, the, uh, to make sure that we have the pH above six for most of our plants, then we'll add six cups of dolomite lime or uh, garden lime. Uh, if we want it more acidic, uh, we'll probably just use uh, the peat moss, but we may also add soil acidifier uh, to get it down, which, which you get can get in garden centers and so forth. Um, and this works, this uh, recipe works very well. This is what we use in the, uh, in the Spudnik garden. This particular re recipe will fill uh, eight 10 gallon, uh, containers or obviously for 20 gallons. And you can see on the, you can compare that with on the right, the commercial kinds of, uh, of uh, container mixes and they're, they're, it's pretty close to what ours is. Ours is very similar to theirs. They have, may have some additional things that could be added like more composted materials. They may add fertilizer to the source, organic or not mycorrhiza or even uh, beneficial bacteria to help with uh, root growth and protect the plants. They may have biochar or something like that or even humic acid in, in it uh, that helps uh, to hold water and take up uh, nutrients. And then actually you can add some of those things to, to your own recipe if you wish. Now one of the problems I have when I or did have when I went into uh, like a garden center and I saw uh, that in the containers, they would be listed in dry gallons, but then you'd go over to the potting mixes and so forth, and they would be listed in cubic feet. Okay, so what do you, how do you, how do you know what you need? So that's why I put this in because 6.43 dry gallons equals one cubic foot. And so I've listed some uh, common, uh, potting sizes there and uh, how much, uh, how many cubic foot of potting mix that it needs. Uh, 10 gallon would be about one and a half cubic feet. And so I find that to be very helpful. I hope you do too. And these are our kids out uh, baking uh, soil, uh, mixing all the components. Uh, the, the group closest to you is mixing uh, the more acidic soil, this is in the early spring, the more acidic soil for the potatoes and blueberries. And then down below, they're mixing the uh, uh, less acidic soil for the, the regular vegetables and so forth. Now, pots to plant in. Um, this, is, uh, this is another big topic and I'm gonna move through it as quickly as I can. There's all kinds of different containers uh, and, and we're going and, and picking the right pots for your purpose, uh, is, is important. Also the right sizes, shapes and so forth. And, uh, we will, uh, move through that. Uh, now here is, uh, these, these are some of the showing, we use the fabric containers and we'll go over why when I get to that point. Uh, but you'll see there's various uh, sizes now, and I'll talk about sizes later, but the size of it depends on the kind of plants that you're putting in it. 
and it largely depends on how many plants you're putting in, but also what are the root structures. You know, the plants that have the bigger root structures are going to have to have larger containers and you can't put those in smaller containers. You can't force them into smaller containers or they won't do well. And, uh, and we'll, we'll talk about that. But you see some of our volunteers here uh, up in the right corner, they're planting some uh, sets, it looks like. Uh, probably, it looks like lettuce sets or greens. You see our garden, uh, our spring garden, the cooler plants planted down in the left corner and a couple of them that are uh, putting uh, soil and fertilizer in the potato plants. And we'll talk about that a little bit too. Um, so, and I went the wrong way, I think. We'll go back the other way. But anything that holds a container, that holds dirt and drains can be a container, a, a garden container, as this illustrates clearly. Okay, uh, planting your container garden. I wanna go back, uh, let me go back to this one just a minute because um, I do wanna say that, uh, you know, that, that I forgot to mention that you can also improvise. And down below on the fence, you can see that there are <laughs> some uh, purses that are used. So it, it, virtually anything can, can be used as a container that again, can hold dirt and, um, and drain. Um, now planting your container garden, uh, one of the most important things you can do here is to, um, is to, uh, get healthy plants. And, uh, but I, you know, before that, uh, I'm gonna go back again. I'm, I, I, I didn't, uh, yeah, I'm going the wrong way. I'm sorry, I need to go back because I, fa I failed to mention something here. Uh, material decisions. I wanna talk a little bit here about uh, in the container constants. Uh, and, and part of that is there are some container constants you need to be aware of. And that is one, you have to have drainage. There has to be holes in the bottom uh, and these can't be blocked uh, because uh, if you don't have drainage, you have moisture buildup that can damage the roots and kill the plants. Porosity, uh, porosity is really important. And what I mean by porosity is that the sides breathe, they let air through them. They're porous enough that they let air through. Uh, and some of the best on that are your basic terracotta pots, uh, wooden pots, but also the fabric ones. The fabrics are very, very good. Now, why is that important? It's important as it lets the air in and the oxygen in. Uh, as the roots grow out and they hit that oxygen out near the, the, the sides of the container, they self prune. In other words, they stop growing. But when they do that, they also send a chemical message back to the plant to put out more roots. And so, so not only do you, do you not get root bound to where you have to transplant to bigger pots, but also uh, you, you put out, they put out more roots and that's a, a healthier thing for the plants. So that porosity is really, uh, is really an important consideration. Uh, the other thing is is weight. Uh, heavy containers with moist soil can be uh, difficult, if not impossible, to move. So you have, you have to be careful of that. Now, in terms of material considerations, there's a lot of things here. Uh, the clay terracotta ones, as I said, were porous, uh, and therefore they they did the root pruning. Uh, but all of these work, but but some of them have uh, positives and negatives about them. The problem with the clay pots is they dry quickly. They also break. Uh, they have to be protected in the winter because if they get some moisture in them and they freeze, they'll break and crack. Uh, the clay glazed pots are non-porous and they retain moisture and they can be heavy, but they look nice and they, if, if uh, worked correctly, they, they will work. Uh, you, you're probably going to have to transplant out of them because you'll get root binding in them. Uh, wood is good insulation, but it's uh, also can be heavier and over time it breaks down. And if you're going to use something that's wood, make sure there's drain holes uh, in the bottom of it that you may have to drill. Plastic is cheap. Uh, there's a huge variety, a lot of shapes and colors, but it is non-porous. 
and you will your plants will in time get root ground bound and you're going to have to repot also they break and they don't winter well they have to be protected the winter because they get real brittle when it gets real cold if they're outside then you have imposters like fiberglass probably polypropylene resin and so forth these last long they're in a lot of shapes and colors they work well but again they're not porous and you have to make sure they drain uh, the fabrics and that's what we use in our in the uh, in the uh, Sputnik garden they have good drainage they don't you don't have to put holes in them because it, it it drains slowly and at a really good pace right through the the fabric they're easy to store they last I've got some going on seven eight years uh, they may not have the look you want, and they can get kind of dirty over time, but uh, I don't care a whole lot about that. I just want them to be able to grow the plants that I want them to grow. And again, they do the root pruning, which is really good. You have concrete that's very, they're very heavy. They're non-porous. Uh, a lot of them you have to put in a permanent spot because you can't just move them around. Uh, you have to be careful that they have drainage, and if they don't have drain holes, you hope you have a concrete bit for your drill to make them. Another way you can use them though is like a drain dish where you put another pot inside them, another container inside them uh, and uh, and plant the plant actually in that. Uh, metal, metal can work uh, but it heats up fast and it cools down fast so you have to be careful not to plant plants too close to the edge because that quick cooling quick and quick heating can damage the roots you have to make sure also they have holes for drain, uh, drainage and over time they can corrode. And then like we've already seen, there's all kinds of other options that you can use. Now moving back and moving on. Um, planting your, uh, planting your, your garden. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but uh, uh, one of the key things here is choosing healthy plants. I mean, there's all kinds of places you can get seeds and plants online in garden centers, hardware stores, master gardener plant and seed sales, and many other places. But choosing healthy plants, if you're going to buy uh, plant sets, is really important. And there's a few rules of that you need to know. And that is younger is better than older, smaller is better than larger. Uh, and uh, few or no blossoms, because once it starts blossoming, blossom, blossoming, uh, it's going to start producing fruit, and that's where all the energy is going to go, rather than the plant growing up more and healthy. And and if it if it if it grows longer, gets bigger and healthier, and so forth, it's going to produce better. Uh, one and uh, so. And that's one of the reasons younger is better than older. And also the older plants tend to get root bound. Now, one of the ways you can check root bound in a garden center, so this slip, slip, if it's possible, slip the plant out a little bit and look and see if, if you see the roots all wrapped around it, it's root bound. You may want to buy something else. If that's what you want, you have to buy it. Uh, when you get it home, you take it out, you trim the, those roots that are wound around, you trim those off, loosen up the the roots gently before you plant it and that will help it to, to do better. Um, you want to make sure that there's no yellow or a few yellowing leaves when you get it home you want to take those off. No dull colors or damage. Uh, you want to see young healthy or new growth. No signs of diseases like uh, spots on the leaves or that sort of thing. No stunted growth and avoid plants with few with fruit on them like tomatoes and peppers. And the reason of that, for that is the same reason for plants with a lot of blooms. Once they start fruiting, that's where all their energy is going to go, not in the growth of the plant. And you want, you want larger, healthier plants. If you do buy one that's got fruit on it, when you get it home, trim that, fr that fruit off and uh, trim off the blooms so that the energy will go back into growing the plant. So moving on. And here we have examples of the kids uh, planting various things at the Spudding Garden up in the right, planting seed potatoes. Uh, the top, uh, or, or I mean, the upper left, uh, top right, uh, I'm teaching uh, some kids there how to plant uh, uh, flower sets in a, a thriller, filler and spiller motif. 
Uh, down the left uh, corner, I'm teaching some of our younger gardeners here how to plant uh, flower seeds in pots uh, on the inside of the parish hall before we take them out to the uh, the children's garden. And then we see some of our youth here planting, uh, uh, it looks like uh, tomato sets in the garden. And we teach them how to do that. And on the sets, of course, you plant those up to uh, whatever the soil level was in the pots they were in. You don't plant them too deep. And then, of course, you, you fertilize before and then you water after. And again, some more uh, examples of uh, planting uh, in the upper left, uh, planting in the uh, pollinator garden. In the bottom left, you see our uh, main garden and the, the pollinator garden in the distance. They're totally planted. This is even, we even have here our uh, warm weather, weather plants in. Upper right there, we're planting our cold uh, weather, our cool weather plants. And then you see the children's garden where we've uh, planted uh, the cool weather plants and gotten those started as well. Uh, in Sputnik, we also have our own, we created our own worm, um, uh, our own worm farm that produced uh, uh, our own um, uh, worm manure there, as well as worm tea and uh, the worm castings. And we use those in the garden, They're excellent fertilizer supplements. Uh, and and once you get it planted, watering is critical, getting the right amount of water. Now, some people ask, all right, what is the right amount of water? And unfortunately, they don't like the answer because the answer is it depends. <clears throat> if you get a lot of rain in a week, you don't water much. If you get a drought period where there's a lot of heat and not much rain, then you have, may have to water every day. Uh, now, the one thing that, uh, and what down in the bottom uh, left or bottom right, we have one of our volunteers who's setting the the sprinkler heads on our automatic water system for the pots, and we set those to try to get the what right amount of water. Uh, and uh, when you're when you're watering pots, you want the water to go deep. You don't want to put just a little bit in where it's shallow because it'll dry out too quick and that'll damage the plant. So when you do water, what we do when we were watering by hand, and we do this with our automatic system too now, we want the water to start coming out uh, the the bottom of the of the uh, container a little bit, not just pouring out, but a little bit. As soon as we see that. We stop watering because we know we've watered deeply and that's what you want to do. By the way, we use organic fertilizer and yes, manures are organic fertilizer, no matter what you may call them. Selecting herbs and vegetables, we're going to move pretty quickly here. This is, uh, you can plant almost any vegetables in containers. In fact, I would say you probably could plant any in containers if it's the right size and right container. But you have, uh, you know, your warm weather or your cool weather plants here. All of these do well, and there'll be more. This is just a selection of some of the things that uh, I or we at Sputnik Garden have planted over time. Uh, here's some examples of uh, of various vegetables in in uh, containers that are doing well. You know, it, you have on the top, you have the carrots, Brussels sprouts, beets. Then you have cabbages, greens, and potatoes. And then across the bottom, you have more like salad greens, onions, and a potato harvest there. So you can, uh, there's, I don't know any, I can't think of any vegetable you can't plant. Uh, some of them that are big vining plants, you may not want to do because they'll spread all over the place. Uh, and this, uh, this is some of the stuff from uh, the Spudnik Garden. Up at the top left, you see one of our preteens by an experiment that we did. We planted some corn that had been bred for the containers uh, and uh, it worked, worked out. We got two ears off of each of the stalks. The only thing is I didn't get quite the germination I wanted. So next year we're gonna do the same thing, but we're gonna plant more seeds. And then if we need to, we'll thin. You see a young cabbage up there at the top uh, that's just starting to head up. This is in the spring. Down below, you see part of our potato harvest that we had. And then on the right side at the bottom, a new, another experiment we did with sweet potatoes. And this is the harvest from one bag. There's about 15 pounds of sweet potatoes in there. I planted three different kinds. The ones that did the best were called Puerto Ricos, and that's what you see there. Uh, 
again, for warmer weathers, uh, this is some of the things that do exceedingly well. And uh, we've planted most, if not all of these at one time or another. Uh, corn and okra, yes, can you can plant those too, because like I said, now they have bred some for that. We planted okra this year, but I didn't plant the okra that was bred for containers. I planted like some uh, uh, Clemson spineless. Uh, it didn't do that well. So I may try it again with some that are bred for specifically for containers. But anyway, here's again some of the warm weather plants that you can see uh, across the top. You have uh, the uh, patio uh, tomato that's uh, bred for containers. Then right beside it, you have a indeterminate tomato that's uh, all staked up. That's uh, uh, and that keeps growing till and making till well into October. Um, and it's in a container. You have cucumbers in the, on the right corner, you have a, uh, a watermelon vine with uh, icebox watermelons growing up uh, uh, trellised on a fence. And you can see the nice egg plants. The next are mouse melons or uh, they're uh, uh, Mexican gherkins. They're small in the cucumber family, actually. Two of my grandkids watering a heat stressed uh, pepper plant of mine in my garden. And then you see the uh, zucchini, the Swiss chard, and then the pole beans. We plant pole beans and they do exceptionally well in containers. And they now are breeding plants for containers in small places. And this is a list of just, uh, you know, it, it's not anything like an exhaustive list. This is just some that they have. By the way, the corn there, the own deck hybrid is what we, we tried in, in the garden this last year. But what you'll see on websites or in catalogs, uh, any more garden, garden catalogs, you'll see things, notations like for containers or works well in containers or small places, or you may see a little icon on there of a flower pot beside it indicating that it does well in containers. And there's a lot more of this than there used to be because the container garden is becoming more popular. Uh, flowers, we're gonna go through this real quickly. Um, you know, an annual is something that uh, uh, lasts for a year, uh, only one year, one season. Uh, they really need, they, they grow very well in containers. And, and one of the re good reasons to grow them in containers is you don't have a long-term commitment to them. Mm -hmm. At the end of the season, you just pull them out and throw them away. Also, uh, when the, if you have some that are, uh, that work well in different times of the year through the season you can do some succession planting with them and you know when your early ones start to fade you can pull those and put in uh, another one and keep it going into the fall um, the uh, plant by sea and that's what i mean plant by season and calendar are they are they a cooler weather plant are they a warmer weather plant and that will determine when you can uh, plant them Perennials, uh, by the way, there are biennials that uh, seed and die in their second year, but uh, perennials are multi-year plants that last over some time. They do offer some challenges, for instance, after they have uh, done their blooming and they've spent, uh, a lot of times they get looking kind of leggy and, and uh, not too hot, and you may want to cut them back if you can do that, if it's the type that you can do that. Uh, Overwintering, you have to be careful that the, in a particular in a container that the roots don't freeze. And so you may have to put them in a safe place or, or wrap them in something or put straw around them, something to protect the roots. And uh, so it's, uh, there's, a, there's a little bit more to them, but they're, they really do well in containers and they, they can be really a neat part of the flower garden. Far as a flower garden for us is concerned, at Spudnik, it was the it was the pollinator garden. You see that in the top left uh, with the church up in the background. Uh, we also have flowers in the main garden to attract pollinators. There, you see the arch. That's a native uh, honeysuckle on it that attracts pollinators. And then on each side of the of the cross, as you look towards the parish hall there uh, down the path, we have flowers planted along there as well. And you see a young man there uh, fertilizing uh, our pollinator plants and uh, down below uh, on the left you see them still constructing our pollinator garden. 
And remember your pollinators, you need them in the garden. So make sure that you provide uh, for your pollinators and get them into your garden. It's very important. And also we hope that this is not your definition of annuals and perennials, but unfortunately uh, for some people that seems to be the case. But if you do see this plant anywhere in a catalog or in a, in a uh, garden center or whatever, please let me know. I have been looking and looking for this plant and I have not yet been able to find it. And finally, or we're getting close to finally, uh, a healthy plant is a happy plant. And this could be a whole program, by the way, so we can't go into a lot of detail on this, but uh, one of the advantage of containers is that they are quite easy uh, as far as uh, maintenance is concerned. And uh, we, we use uh, integrated plant management and containers uh, make that rather easy as well. One of the things is, like I said before, each plant, each one of them is kind of mini garden to itself. So it's, uh, it's very easy. Uh, and when you, in, particularly at the beginning, because the soil you originally put in there, the container mix that you originally put in there will be sterile. So there won't be any, there won't be any soil borne plant disease pathogens or uh, any any insects or insect larvae or insect uh, eggs or anything in the soil. And so you won't have the first year, you won't have many of those problems. Not that you can't have something like early blight and, and so forth that comes in from the outside, but uh, you're not gonna have uh, those kinds of problems that you might have just in a, a regular garden or a raised bed. You do need to have consistent container care. And by that, I mean, at the end of the, end of the season, you know, dump the dirt into a wheelbarrow or something on your container, cleanse it. And I use a 10, we use a 10% bleach solution to do that. And, uh, and then you can either put the soil back in if you want, but if you do renew it, or you can, you can do what we do at Spudnik Garden is we keep the soil under tarps and so forth, and then uh, reuse it and renew it uh, the next year. And we store our uh, cleansed uh, containers. Um, in integrated press, uh, pest management, you certainly want uh, to, to do a lot of prevention. And you can do that by uh, a number of things. One is, like I said, cleansing your, your containers, but also uh, by buying uh, resistant plants that resist uh, certain diseases and also some of them that resist certain insects. Uh, making sure you uh, you clean your garden in the sense that you remove debris and so forth, where uh, slugs and other uh, and other insect pests and, and their larvae uh, might exist, might uh, you know, might live. Um, you can also use row covers, uh, and it, particularly if you know like uh, flea beetles are going to show up somewhere around the end of uh, May do row covers over your eggplants to keep them off of it uh, until that thread is passed, that sort of thing. If you do need to move to sprays like fungicides and insecticides, always start with the least toxics. And uh, there are, and, and another thing that you can do before I move to that is uh, that's more of a passive thing, is you can also plant various plants that attract, uh, that attract uh, your good insects, those that are, that, that attack those that are insect pests. And some of those include Queen Anne's lace, parsley, sweet al alyssum, fennel, yarrow, and several others. There's a, there's a bunch of them. But always start with the least toxic. Never use a, um, never use a persistent chemical uh, spray uh, because those, uh, those persistent sprays are generally general insecticides and they will kill your beneficial insects, your pollinators when they come on there. There's a lot of good things out here that you can use in a targeted way. Uh, BT, which is a bacillus uh, thuringiensis, which is a bacterial based one. Uh, is really good for attacking soft-bodied things like caterpillars. 
Um, and another one that's a, a bacillus based is spinosad, and that attacks a lot of different uh, uh, insect pests. Uh, but those only attack those that are chewing insects. They won't work against the, the really annoying ones to me, and those are the sucking insects, uh, things like uh, the squash bugs and uh, the stink bugs. Uh, and so you may have to use something that's more of a general uh, insecticide on those. You can use like a horticultural oil or, or a neem oil or something like that. Uh, you can use perinthins, which is a, uh, it's also a plant derived thing, but it, but it's a general insecticide, but it's not persistent. But you have to be really careful when you use those that you're targeting what you want to target and not just generally spraying and not spraying because you can, those, those things can kill your beneficials too. And you want to spray when you're using those at a time, the beneficials aren't really out there very much. But when you do, make sure you're looking on the bottom of the leaves and spraying on the bottoms as well as the tops, because a lot of times that's where you're going to find the plant, the, the insect eggs, and, and you want to spray the eggs as well. Uh, in terms of uh, diseases, uh, you can certainly use, uh, there, there are several different kinds of uh, fungicides that you can use, and we use them. Uh, we try to use, and we do use, uh, organic ones. So we'll use neem oil, we'll use a copper-based fungicide, sulfur-based fungicide, and we tend to rotate those. And the reason that we rotate them is because uh, if you just use one all the time, the funguses can develop resistance to those. So if you, if you alternate them, there's less chance of doing that. Um, also there, you wanna make sure you spray the whole thing underneath and and on top of the leaves and, and so forth. And I use those as preventive and start spraying uh, after the plants get so high before diseases show up. And then I'll spray about every two weeks. And if I start seeing like early blight or something appear, then we may go to every week uh, spraying to, uh, to help knock that down or, or at least slow it down. As far as the larger animals like deer and uh, uh, groundhogs and so forth. Then you have, uh, uh, there's several things. We use, I use the stinky sprays. They work well, but you have to renew them every couple of weeks. And you also have to uh, renew them after it rains. You can have barriers like fences and that sort of thing. Uh, and, uh, but uh, if, if all else fails, you can try what this woman does. And by the way, this was just pictures of our Spudnik garden uh, and our Spudnik kids. Uh, one of them there on the left spraying with a copper fungicide, our peppers. You can see where the kids down there in the bottom right have cleansed our, our bags. And then I'm uh, in the upper right, I'm teaching the kids how to properly uh, apply fertilizer and to use insecticides and, and herbicides. So we do that kind of training out there in Spudnik. Uh, and if you need help in your garden, you may try this. It may work. You never know. Okay, we're just about to the end. Resources. These are some resources that I've used. I've found all of them to be credible. Uh, as far as books are concerned, uh, the first three are general uh, on container gardening. And by the way, container gardening for dummies is really quite good. Uh, the next four are have to do with garden design, and then the last two specifically about vegetables. Uh, resources for tools and supplies, I've used these. I would say there's another one that's uh, dripworks.com for uh, irrigation uh, stuff that's quite good as well. Helpful websites, I want to point you here to the uh, very last one, which is our University of Maryland Extension Home and Garden Information Center. Uh, excellent source of all kinds of information. And I, would, I would encourage you to use that as much as possible. And with that, we have come to the end. And this was brought to you by uh, Master Gardeners. And do we have any questions that I might be able to help you with? Yes, um, thank you, Cheryl. This is really great. So the first question was, um, 
where do you buy worm castings or can you buy worm castings? Yes, uh, you can get those. I know that uh, several places carry them. Uh, your garden centers will carry them. Uh, your hardware stores, some of them will. I know Ace does. Uh, you know, the, I'm not giving a commercial for anybody, but <laughs> I just know that they have them there. Uh, and yeah, so just about any of your garden centers, uh, your nurseries uh, and hardware stores, some of your hardware stores will have them and you can you can find the worm castings there. You can also find them online, various places. Okay, and where did you buy your fabric pots or your growing bags? Uh, you can you can get some of those at garden centers these days or carrying them, but I got most of mine online uh, at a couple of different places. Uh, again, we're not supposed to to, <laughs> to have commercials, uh, but there's a couple of places that carry a, a lot of different types of them, which I think is important to know. And one of them is Gardener Supply, and the other one's GardenersEdge.com, uh, and and uh, and so that's where we've purchased a lot of ours. But you can also find some in garden centers. Um, another question is how should you um, buy sweet potatoes? Right now Walmart is selling them and it just looks like a sweet potato in the container. So what should you um, be looking uh, for when buying a sweet potato to plant? Uh, what you want to buy for, unless you want to use the sweet potatoes to grow your own slips, you don't just plant the potato in the ground. Uh, if you're going to buy a sweet potato like that, you'll actually have to uh, cut it kind of in half and put it in water and let it start uh, putting the base of it, at least in water, and let it start sprouting and growing the slips. And after the slips get up uh, several inches tall, six inches or taller, so then you remove those, you put those in water, let them root, and that's what you plant. It's much easier if you go to a garden center or someplace uh, or even order online and order the and get the slips themselves. And then you just take those slips and you plant them fairly deeply, you know, several inches uh, into, but you leave some of the slips above the ground as well in the in your soil, water them good and uh, and let them grow. And, and don't worry if they look like they're not in very good shape uh, and that you think, man, will, will this thing make it? Because uh, they're very hardy and they recover. And so, but it's, it's much better to, it's much easier, let's put it that way, and less time consuming just to get the slips and plant them. Okay, do you have any suggestions of pollinator plants specifically that's available locally? Any, say that pollinator again. Plants. Poll pollinator plants. Oh yeah, well there's, uh, first of all, native plants. Make sure they're native plants. And I can tell you some that we have in our pollinator garden. Uh, I, I don't have the whole list in front of me, but I, uh, we one of the things you definitely want to plant are, uh, are milkweeds. And that's not just for monarchs, but it is especially for monarchs because that's the host, host plant. And, uh, but it's also other, other uh, pollinators use it as well. And, uh, and there's, a, there's several different kinds. You know, the, the butterfly weed is actually a, one of those. Uh, the common milkweed, the red milkweed, the whirl milkweed and so forth. There's several different ones. And I usually plant two or three of those uh, in, in the pollinator garden or in my home garden. And we did get uh, what was really neat is we did get uh, monarchs coming in and actually uh, laying eggs and we had brand new monarchs hatch out and we got to see them sit there and dry in their wings and take their first flight. So that was really cool. But anyway, other ones, uh, Blazing Morning Star is really good. Um, any of your cone flowers are excellent. Joe pie weeds, and there's a couple of different kinds of Joe pie weed are, are very good. Um, uh, bergamot uh, and uh, and it, it goes it goes on and on. There's a, there's a lot. Uh, and uh, the Master Gardener website. Yeah, and if you go onto the Master Gardener website, I gave you. Uh, you can you can go in there and and find a lot of that information. You you really can. That'll give you a lot more. Um, but uh, anyway, the thing of it is, 
I would, the thing I would encourage is make sure you're planting natives because that's what our, uh, that's what our uh, pollinators need and that's what they have been adapted to. Okay, so I know um, this question probably can be answered during our campaign and planting on April 10th, but um, they were wondering if you have any suggestions on um, vegetables and herb plants that can um, work well in the same container. Uh, yeah, uh, they, either the same container or very near each other. I, I mentioned one, um, and that was uh, beans and potatoes. That first year, we planted only pole beans and potatoes, and we had them. We had the containers close together, and the reason for that is is uh, they are good companion plants in the sense that they um, the the Colorado potato beetles don't seem to like beans <laughs> and the Mexican bean beetles don't seem to like potatoes. And it's really interesting. Uh, this last year, uh, we planted, we did the same thing. We do it every year. And, uh, but we only had, we only planted enough of the pole beans to cover about uh, two thirds of the row of potatoes. And that last third of the row where the, we didn't have the beans beside them, we actually got uh, Colorado potato beetles in there, a bit of an infestation that we had to spray for, but the ones that were beside the beans didn't have any. So I guess, <laughs> I guess that works. But yeah, there's uh, carrots and tomatoes go well together. Uh, and, and there's, uh, uh, you know, most any, uh, you can plant a lot of the herbs together with other, with other vegetables uh, too, uh, whether it's thyme or, uh, I wouldn't plant rosemary together because that becomes kind of a bush, but uh, uh, you know, there's uh, savory, there's a number of other ones, parsley that you can plant. And a lot of those draw beneficial insects too. So, but anyway, you do have a companion planting class coming up that'll get in more detail than that. But once again, I would go to the website that, you know, our home and garden information website has a lot of that kind of stuff for you. Do you ever sterilize um, the compost? No, uh, I don't have a means to sterilize the compost. Uh, and uh, no, we just, uh, we, either, we either buy commercial compost, which we do for the Spudnik Garden, because we don't have a big composter down at the church. I have a composter at home and I use that to supplement because I don't raise, I don't have enough compost to do my whole garden as well. And so I use commercial compost as well as my own compost, but no, I don't. Uh, then now the, the commercial compost may be, may be sterile when it comes in, but uh, my own won't be, but I still use it and I don't seem to have any problems with it. Do you have any recommendations for tomatoes that you grow in containers? Yes, just about any you want. And here's, here's why I say that. There's some, if you go on to, um, if you go on to uh, uh, some of the catalogs online and so forth, you'll see some tomatoes now that are, that are bred for containers and they will tell you that. You also, indeterminate tomatoes, regardless of what they are, will do well in containers. And, uh, and those you can do well with about 15 gallon containers. But I also grow the uh, indeterminates and it varies every year. Uh, and I grow, I, I grow both the open pollinated heirlooms, but I also grow some hybrids and most of the ones that are bred for containers now are hybrids. And, but some of the hybrids now are really good. And a lot of them are bred from some of the heirlooms. And, uh, but uh, I would say pick out whatever tomato plant you like and you can grow it in a container. Now, if it's indeterminate, you're gonna have to have a larger container like a, uh, like a 20 or even 24, 25 gallon container. So you have plenty of root room and you're gonna have to uh, use uh, uh, some kind of staking or cages or a combination of both because they're gonna, the, the vines are gonna get quite big. Uh, but I've grown, I, I have one that it's a, a pollinator. It's an open pollinated uh, heirloom called Marianne. 
partly I cho chose it because that's my wife's name, but also it's a rare tomato. Back in the late 19th century, it used to be a really, uh, really uh, kind of popular tomato. It's a medium-sized slicer. It's a, a, it's a red tomato, It's and it's a, a very, very uh, good flavored tomato. Uh, and I have I have selectively saved seeds on that, which means that uh, when I say selectively, I planted several vines each year, and then when I uh, and I and I choose the tomatoes off of the very the, the ones that are the healthiest vines and the ones that produce the most and the largest tomatoes, and those are the ones I saved. And over time now, uh, the and I grow those now from seed myself, uh, they do exceedingly well in the garden. Some smaller tomatoes like Tommy Toes do very well. Uh, German Heads I've had really good luck with. Um, uh, what's that? Sun Gold. Oh yeah, Sun Golds, if you like cherry tomatoes, do exceptionally well in them. Um, and uh, Olena Ukrainian, another heirloom. Um, and uh, I planted one last year that I'd never planted before. It's an heirloom called Wisconsin 55. It makes a smaller tomato that's about uh, two inches in diameter, but boy, it's loaded all year long and, and made right up to frost. But, you know, you can plant virtually anything you want. What size of container are you looking at um, to growing vegetables? And they want the gallon. Okay, well, this, the smallest container we use is a 10 gallon. And again, the, the, the thing that you're looking for is how many plants are you going to plant in it? How many sets or seeds? That's number one. Number two, is it going to be a, and a, another consideration, is it going to be a vining type plant like a melon or a cucumber or a squash or something like that? Uh, is it going to be a large plant with a with a deep root system? Uh, is it going to be a a root crop with a deeper root system? All those things have to you know come into play on this. So it, uh, when I again the smallest one that we use is a ten gallon. Now that a ten gallon one you can get uh, three or four um, like lettuce plants in it. Uh, and, and they'll do fine uh, if you plant in lettuce sets. You can also plant seeds in them, but we tend to use set, the, the tomato sets. Uh, it, you know, you can go to uh, 12 gallon too for the, the same thing. Uh, so 10 to 12 gallons for the leafy plants, you know, collards and uh, kale and so forth do well in that size of a pot. Uh, and uh, any of the leafy plants that don't have a real deep root, root system will use the smaller containers, 10 to 12. When you get to, uh, and, and also you can use it for cabbages too, but you only want to put one cabbage per container. You, you, they just don't do well if you, if you try to put more than that. But if you put one per container, they do exceedingly well. So does broccoli, for instance, as a matter of fact. And uh, we haven't planted much in terms of cauliflower, but it can do well also, but you're gonna put one per container. Uh, if you're going to, when you move to plants that are vining plants, let me go to those next. Like, like I said, like cucumbers, and we plant uh, cantaloupes that are bred for containers. We plant small watermelons bred for containers. We plant some squash, but these vine, and the sweet potatoes will vine too. Then you're looking there more, not so much depth, although you still want things, you know, at least uh, none of our containers are less than a foot deep, but you want something that has a larger surface area, uh, you know, so that can contain those vines to some degree. They're gonna still spill over, but, uh, uh, and uh, so you want something that's about 20 inches across at, at uh, at a minimum, 20 to 24 inches across for those. Most of ours be like 20 inches across uh, and they may be like 14 inches deep. Uh, and that would be something in the vicinity of, uh, again, you're talking somewhere around 16 to 20 gallons, uh, but, but it's the diameter that's most important on those kinds of things. And then uh, when you get to those kinds of vegetables that have deeper root systems like uh, like your peppers, your eggplants, and particularly your tomatoes, uh, then 
then you want the bigger, you, you know, I don't plant, I plant peppers. I have plant, I do plant them some, it depends on the size of the pepper plant in a, in a 12 uh, gallon, but mostly it's in the 15 gallon size for the peppers and the determinate tomatoes. And when I get to the indeterminate tomatoes, then I'm going to the 20 to 24 size, uh, gallon size containers, because you need plenty of soil for the root systems uh, for those bigger plants. So it, it, you know, it depends on the type of plant, depends on how many plants are right now for beans, for instance, like pole beans. Now the bush beans, you know, you plant those in the uh, like 12 gallon containers and plant several beans in there. Um, things that are root vegetables that are deeper roots, uh, maybe like, uh, well, certainly potatoes, you want those in deeper, at least 14 inches deep, if not 16. Um, and those you want about uh, 15 gallon to, uh, and, and even depending on how many potatoes, seed potatoes you're going to put in them, you may want to go as high as 20 or 25 gallon. Uh, for instance, I have at home, I use 25 gallon and I'll plant, plant 10 uh, seed to, uh, potatoes in there. We use the 15 gallon at uh, the church and, and we put uh, four or five in those. So, uh, it, it partly depends on what you're doing, but uh, but all of ours range from like 10 gallons up to about uh, 25 gallons. Okay, and where do you um, get your native um, milkweed seeds? I know that you can get native um, th plants through the Chesapeake Natives um, located in Upper Marble, but where do you get your seeds? Yeah, and and that's one of the places that we use some of some of the garden centers have them. You know, they'll they'll have the milkweed seeds and the and the uh, some of the native plant seeds. But also, there's some sites on online that speci that specifically raise them. Uh, and one of them is PrairieMoonNursery.com, and another one is I think it's just PrairieNursery.com, uh, and they have them. But some of your other uh, and they, that's all, they, they specialize only in that. And they, they have both seeds and they have, uh, and they have sets as well. Uh, but uh, some of the major, uh, some of the major uh, companies like Burpee and others now are starting to carry that, uh, some of those as well. And also a good site is um, Chesapeake Bay um, Native Plant Center. They give you really a list of um, Maryland yeah. natives by region too. Um, uh, you can also go to the uh, the Maryland Native Plant Society and they will have suggestions for you. Yes, all good sources. Um, the next one is they were wondering if you add any elements after you plant your um, vegetables like nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, calcium, magnesium, etc. Yes. We do. We uh, we fertilize before we begin, uh, and with the tomatoes, we uh, usually put some extra uh, calcium in, uh, maybe through bone meal or something else, uh, uh, to to make sure that we, uh, and also with peppers and eggplants, anything that uh, where you could get blossom end rot, which tends tends to be a uh, problem with not enough calcium. We do that. We amend it. Uh, we also, but we we use uh, organic fertilizers that have a lot of those micronutrients, as well as the the major ones of the uh, nitrogen, uh, phosphorus, and potassium. Uh, and we fertilize on a schedule. You know, if you if you get a bag of uh, say commercial organic fertilizer, I mean, we make our own too. <laughs> we've made our we have our own that we've made. But uh, if you get a, a bag of that commercial, it's going to say on the back uh, how often, you know, you should use that. And so we have uh, fertilizing schedules that we have, like for potatoes, for instance. Let me just mention that when you plant potatoes, you're, you're wanting, we have like at the church, a 16 inch deep, deep bag and about 16 inches across the top. And you don't just plant those and cover them up. We put about three or four inches of soil in the bottom. We put fertilizer in it for root crops. That's like a three, four, three fertilizer it has micronutrients in it too, because it's organic. 
And then we put our seed potatoes. We'll put four or five seed potatoes on top of that and then fill it up uh, where we're covering it with about three more inches of soil. Fertilize that, then water it in where it's moist, not wet. And then when they start starts growing, uh, we add more soil in there but leave about two, two and a half inches of the green leafy part above and also fertilize the new soil that comes in by what the directions are on the, on the fertilizer. And we keep doing that process until we get about an inch and a half from the top of the bag and then we let it go and the potatoes grow. Now the reason we do that, it's like hilling potatoes in the ground, is because as you do that, they're gonna, it's gonna put out more shoots and it's gonna grow more potatoes up, up the vine. And then potatoes are really neat because they tell you when they're ready to pick because you know about two or three months down the road, they start turning yellow and falling over and turning dry and they're done, they're ready to pick. About a week after they do that, week to two weeks, uh, you can dig the potatoes, really easy to do with uh, containers. You just dump it in a wheelbarrow or dump it on a tarp and get your potatoes and then you can reclaim the soil if you want. Are you able to use the fabric bags um, from the store to grow um, vegetables and stuff? It depends on what it is. Um, yeah, you can. It just depends on what it is and what what kind it is. For instance, one of them that I don't use, I've tried the burlap. Doesn't work. That rots through by the end of the season. So burlap doesn't doesn't work well at all. Uh, you also want to make sure that it's a bag that will drain. You know, some bags are, you know, kind of a plastic mix or something and are coated. And, and if you're going to use that, you're going to have to punch holes in the bottom of it because it won't drain. But yeah, you, there's certain, you can use certain bags from, from there. You, again, they need to be the right size for the right plant. So are you looking more like um, the fabric bags that are made like a polyester, cotton, linen kind of thing? Yeah, really. And, and some of them are made out of recycled, uh, a combination of like recycled plastic bottles and then other kinds of materials. That's what the bags we use at the, at the Spudney Garden are made from. And uh, those are excellent. And they last a long time. Okay, so that was the end of the questions on chat. So I'm going to stop recording. Everybody is welcome to um, stay on if they have any questions. I just want to remind you that we do have another Garner Smarter um, Saturday the 21st, and it's more of a um, Garner Roundtable, so a very conversational one, and that one will not be recorded. Um, if you have any other questions, you can stay on, but I'm going to stop the recording.